Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Really appreciate uh, you all coming today. My name is Rick Blaskin with the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals. It's a real honor to be here to talk about what's going on in our industry. Uh, the U.S. Data Logistics Report is a fundamental uh, foundation of what uh, we have seen, but importantly, what we are going to see as the report, you'll find out, looks into the future to talk about not only the cost of logistics, but importantly, the trends that are driving them. Uh, so we're really excited to, uh, to unveil this year's report. I want to thank our, our partner in Penske. They've been uh, presenting this report, supporting us, and uh, we've been working with them over a multitude of things. But this has been a real terrific partnership and a, and a testimonial to what collaboration means. This is our ninth year working with Penn. I want to thank them for, for everything that they've done and, and their traditional uh, terrific support that they've, they've provided. And of course, our partners with uh, AT Kearney, you'll hear from Michael, and they've got uh, folks who really understand modes of all modes of transportation, how they relate to one another, and they do a great job in talking to companies about their views and perspectives on, as I said, not just the cost, but importantly, the trends that are driving them. I also want to thank Mark Baxson. Mark is our current board of uh, CSCMP. Mark is here. He's uh, the founder and CEO of Fernia Creek uh, Consulting and had a long, rich career with Monsanto and other companies. So Mark, thanks for your support as well. So that with that, let me just introduce our moderator extraordinaire of Kevin Smith. He's our State of Logistics panel moderator. He's also the president and CEO of Sustainable Supply Chain Consulting. Uh, before founding that company in 2009, he was Senior Vice President of Supply Chain and Logistics and Corporate Sustainability Officer for CVS Caremark, now CVS Health. Uh, prior to that, uh, he spent 27 years in the food industry. Uh, among other positions, he was VP of Customer Support at H.J. Hines and Director of Network Design and Implementation of, at uh, Kraft Foods. He's past chairman of the board of CSCMP and a special advisor to World 50 and Supply Chain 50. He served on the board of RFXL Corporation and was chairman of the board for Agentrix and is past chairman of the Supply Chain and Logistics Committee for the National Association of Trained Drug, Chain Drug Stores, and then he goes to lunch. Uh, he currently spends a good deal of time here in Washington with the National Ac uh, Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine on projects that uh, advise Congress on matters that affect supply chain operations and, and safety. And he's a graduate of the University of Massachusetts. Uh, I think he's a Boston Red Sox fan, and being from Chicago, that's an issue, but we'll look beyond that for the day. We'll Kevin? Be, we'll be okay. Thank All you, right. Rick. Thanks, everybody. Well, good morning again. It is great to be here again as the moderator for the, for the panel. Uh, we have a great panel today. I'd like to introduce them first before we get into the report. Uh, on my far left is Ken Bronbach. Ken is Vice President of Inbound Transportation for Walmart Supply Chain. Ken leads, a support, leads supports inbound 3PL dedicated operations, global logistics and transportation strategy. He joined Walmart in 2002 after running trucking operations in several states. At Walmart, he's held leadership positions in carrier relations, transportation strategy, and e-commerce. Ken is a former Army engineer and logistics officer, retiring after 29 years with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you for your service, Ken. Uh, he graduated from Syracuse University and UCLA. Thank you for being here. Next to Ken is Jill Donahue. Jill is Vice President of Supply Chain for Bumblebee Seafoods, LLC. Jill is a dedicated supply chain professional working primarily in customer package goods, consumer package goods. In her current role, she's responsible for customer service, warehousing, transportation, and global planning. Prior to Bumblebee, Jill worked in various roles at Keebler Foods, a Pecanini Plastic Packaging, and Kraft Foods. Jill is a member of CSCMP and GMA, and is on the Supply Chain Management Institute of the University of San Diego. She holds business and operations degrees from the University of Tennessee and DePaul University in Chicago. Thank you, Jill, for coming. Next to Jill is a familiar face. Mark Alton is the president of Penske Logistics. Mark began his career as a project engineer for Chevron before joining Jelco Truck Leasing. He became a Penske employee following a 1988 merger with that company. Since then, he's held a wide range of positions of increasing responsibility in Penske companies, culminating in his current role, which he assumed in 2010. Mark is a member of CSAMP, sits on the board of Fleet Wash, as well as a number of charitable organizations in the Reading, Pennsylvania area, where he resides with his family. Mark holds a degree in chemical engineering from the University of Kentucky. Thank you again for coming. On my far right is Stephen Bob. Uh, Steve is the Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer for, B for BNSF Railway. Uh, since 2013, Steve has overseen uh, sales, marketing, customer service, economic development, economic ma equipment management, and intermodal facilities. 
Sounds like a small job, but for somebody to do. Uh, Steve previously headed up BNF's, BNSF's coal business group. He joined Burlington Northern in 1987, and since that time has held many diverse positions of increasing responsibility across all facets of the railroad's business. Steve is a graduate of the University of North Dakota. Thank you, Steve. Next to Steve is Derek Leathers. Derek is President and Chief Executive Officer for Warner Enterprises. Uh, Derek has 25 years of experience in the transportation world and 17 years of leadership experience with Warner. He's held numerous positions within Warner, including the development of Warner's Mexico cross-border operations, uh, oversight of assets, and launching the company's global logistics that encompasses transportation and freight movement, intermodal, ocean, air, and brokerage. Prior to joining Warner, Derek was one of the first foreign members of Canacar, the Mexican Trucking Association based in Mexico City. Derek holds a degree in economics from Princeton University. Derek, thank you for being with us. And finally, to my right is the principal author of today's report, Michael Zimmerman. Michael's a partner at AT Kearney, leading the firm's North American analytics practice. Michael has 20 years of consulting experience, half of which has been dedicated to the supply chain industry. Michael advises global companies on a wide range of supply chain and logistics issues. His areas of expertise include logistics sourcing, logistics optimization, strategic sourcing, lean manufacturing, three and four PL assessment and selection. He collaborates with global organizations and industries including CPG, retail, grocery, chemicals, healthcare and automotive. Before joining AT Kearney, Michael was a partner at Atlas Supply, which he co-founded in 2004. Prior to that, he held positions at Free Markets, United Technologies, and U.S. Surgical, which is now Covidian. Michael holds degrees from Darden, UVA, and Amherst College. He's based at A.T. Kearney's New York office, and now I'll call upon Michael to present this year's report. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Terrific. So, um, beginning at the beginning, um, welcome to the 2019 State of Logistics Report. Uh, the overview and the supporting panel discussion. As usual, I'll work to get uh, through our highlights in a relatively efficient manner, leaving most of our time for the panel discussion. When we stood here 12 months ago, we, com we commented that we had, if anything, understated uh, the pace of the turnaround for the depressed rates uh, and excess capacity of 2017, and we characterized the tightening capacity environment and higher rates of 2018 as steep grade ahead. It proved to be the case as leaders of the logistics capabilities in most firms we spoke to reported the most challenging year of their careers. This year's report identifies an industry at a new crossroads. Um, after toughening out, you know, toughing out that steep grade of last year's capacity crunch and rising prices. In the latter half of 2018 and into 2019, demand has softened and growth is in doubt, but not to the point where a steep decline is visible a context we summarize as cresting the hill. Carriers have paused or even reversed rate increases while curtailing capacity growth, and shippers have breathed easier as capacity has become more abundant. Near the midpoint of 2019, many experts expect the economy to slow further, citing trade tensions, rising debt, and consumer exhaustion. On the other hand, trends such as e-commerce, uh, growth, lower fuel prices, and technology-driven efficiency gains could, do, could bode well for logistics. Historically, slowing growth and rising capacity have caused shippers to aggressively seek lower rates, causing suppliers to respond by slashing costs and investments, a boom-bust cycle beginning anew. The authors, sponsors, and interviewees in this report have cause for optimism because at the crest of this hill, neither shippers or suppliers seem satisfied with business as usual and the opportunity to leverage technology and collaborative practices is driving tangible efficiencies and shared gains. On the collaboration, this has been a very successful collaboration between uh, CSCMP, Penske, and AT Kearney. That continues. We have a long history of collaboration with CSCMP dating back to predecessor ent uh, entities, and we're glad to extend that collaboration for our fourth year and the 30th anniversary of the report. So we have a proven approach, similar in structure to last year, reflecting our ongoing effort to enhance industry context. The report contains extensive economic analysis, 
which underpins our macroeconomic assessment, which in turn drives the demand and supply dynamics for the state of US logistics. Extensive interviews across shippers, carriers, and technology providers and users brings to life the challenges and solutions being experienced by the industry players on the ground, on the water, in the air, and even in pipelines. We also continue to not only reflect back on 2018, but to, be, to bring more current in-year perspectives and be more forward-looking. And so I've updated and enhanced our analysis of new technologies and approaches driving improvements in logistics management and execution with reviews of automation, application of AI, and the promise of 5G. The report is truly a team effort. A.T. Kearney's transportation industry, operations, and logistics analytics teams, and the modal leads within them wrote the individual sections, while our Global Business Policy Council wrote the macroeconomic section. Data and industry insights were supplied by IHS Market, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BLS, and Armstrong Associates, as well as our partners and interviewees, such as Penske, C.H. Robinson, Werner, Intel, and Walmart, among others. So, the reveal, if you will. Um, U.S. business logistics costs. After 2017's cost increase of 4.1% over 2016, total U.S. business logistics costs of 1.47 trillion, 2018 more than crested the 1.5 trillion mark, by reaching 1.64 trillion for a year-on-year -year growth of 11.4%. During the same period, we saw U.S. nominal GDP increase 2.9%, resulting in U.S. business logistics costs as a percent of GDP increase of 50 basis points to 8% of nominal GDP. This ties the, most, the more recent high of 8% in 2014, but does not beat the 2008 number of 8.5%, when GDP had shrunk by 0.1% and logistics costs had stayed relatively high. So highlights from the cost table. We'll be touching on each of the modes in more detail in subsequent pages, but in 2018, all sub, sub segments of US business logistics costs have increased to the highest level since 2014. So let me touch on the highlights briefly. In motor carriers, private and dedicated fleets led the way up by 13%, continuing the underlying shift from common to dedicated carriage, and shippers with captive fleets had to pay their drivers more, of course. Big cost driver there. FTL and LTL increases were close behind at 8.3 and 7.6%, and despite the warning signs in the second half of 2017, Shippers were caught by surprise by the severity of the spot market rate jumps in the first half of 2018 in Over the Road. Then carriers saw significant spot rate drops in the latter half of the year as capacity caught up and demand softened. Brokers had, that had issued contracted rates for the full year found themselves upside down and had to bring their shippers back to the negotiati negotiating table for relief. Parcel was up over 8%, reflecting the strong e-commerce growth and pricing power from the providers. On the rails, intermodal led the way with a near 29% increase, and car loads continued its relative underperformance with a 7.2% increase and a five-year CAGR at negative 0.6%. Air freight rose 9.2%, and over the water swelled 12.8% as both strong international commerce and carrier pricing discipline were seen over the year, further spurred by shipments anticipated due to tariff fears. Inventory carrying costs rose sharply as the inventory buildup in the back half of 2018 drove inventory costs up 14.8% overall. Other costs from carrier and shipper support activities were not spared, rising 6.4% in aggregate Inefficiencies in carrier support activities driven by the scramble to arrange for capacity overcame apparent productivity improvements in shipper administrative costs. With that background, let's move into a bit more detail. Macroeconomics. The GDP backdrop suggests a growth tide receding, but the signals are mixed and by no means is the direction certain. 
Last year, we noted that economic growth revved up with more in store. The IMF projection of real GDP growth of 2.9% in the United States in 2018, up from 2.3% in 2017, proved to be on the money. The US economy is flashing warning signs. As the IMF and leading investment banks indicate, economic growth will slow in 2019 and beyond to sub 2% in 2020. Despite the rebound in consumer sentiment and GDP growth in Q1 of 2019, talk of recession is in the air. Trade uncertainty ripples through logistics markets since just trade tension fears causes inventory buildups that shift logistics services demand. Employed, excuse me, employment showed consistent strength in 2019 with the unemployment rate falling to 3.6% and wage growth climbing to 3.4% suggesting wages in logistics will probably rise further. We continue to monitor automation and other productivity-enhancing technologies expected to provide cost relief, but the time frame for adoption varies across logistics providers. While automation is already in place in many warehouses, for instance, it will still be years before autonomous trucks um, reduce demand for drivers. We'll dig deeper into the promise of technology in the report with a supplemental section on the promise of 5G for the logistics industry. Business investment is one of the areas where economists expected the biggest boost from US tax reform, which resulted in businesses getting a significant tax cut. So what about a boost in business investment to further drive growth? A recent survey of supply chain professionals reported an overwhelmingly neutral or ambiguous impact of the tax reform to date. Companies across the economy largely use tax savings to fund share buybacks rather than investments. The 1.5 trillion 10-year infrastructure plan outlined during the President's 2018 State of the Union address seems unlikely to materialize despite the still valid estimate from the American Society of Civil Engineers that the United States needs to invest 4.6 trillion in roads, bridges, ports, and other transportation infrastructure by 2025. Such stimulus would be welcome to shippers and carriers alike, as it would improve safety and transit times and lower shipping costs while providing the US economy with a boost. More on macroeconomics. US consumer confidence and personal consumption tell a mixed story. The Consumer Confidence Index uh, hovered well over 95% in 2018 before taking a dip in the opening months of 2019, then bounce back to finish Q1 2019 at 98.1%. The personal consumption index showed a similar pattern, suggesting a potential return to optimism after a lull. With so much American wealth tied up in the housing market, slowdowns in existing home sales and weakening ho housing starts may drag down consumer confidence going forward. On the bright side, unemployment remains at a 50-year low of 3.6%, and wage growth has accelerated to a rate of 3.4%, the highest in 10 years. Retail sales data, choppy in the first quarter of 2019, rose 0.3% in April, 0.5% in May, hardly a contraction. The regime of planned Fed rate increases that seemed so certain in 2018 has been put on hold, as the Fed now seems ready to be accommodative should the economy falter. Of course, we'll learn more about that today. The US Energy Information Administration, EIA, forecasts lower fuel prices for 2019, and the most recent DOE on highway diesel price was 310 a gallon, down from 326 at this time last year. A little more on macroeconomics, inventories and inventory to sales ratio. Um, Inventory productivity, as reflected in the business inventory to sales ratio, which had improved from 2016's 1.42 to an average of 1.38 in 2017, and was at 1.34 when we reported last year, jumped back to 1.39 by year end as supply chains stocked up to head off the impact of tariffs. On trade, the biggest issue among many is the ongoing USA-China trade tension, which shows no sign of resolution. On other fronts, potential automobile tariffs are creating tensions with Europe, Japan, and other auto exporters, and the recent 
Flaring then calming of tariff tensions with Mexico gave US-Mexico supply chains an unwelcome roller coaster ride. Each of these issues has, significant, has significantly impacted the logistics industry, as companies must prepare for uncertain volumes and sources. Separately, Chinese domestic policy is further roiling the ocean freight sector as its sh sweeping shift in its recycling program, which has brought its imports down to nearly zero. It's leaving massive volumes of recycling materials stranded in ports and across major economies, including in the United States. Let's get into the modes, uh, starting with motor carriers. So trucking tonnage and spot rates delivered an excellent year for carriers and shippers were left largely uh, licking their wounds. Uh, representing $670 billion in spend, trucking represents by far the largest contributor to U.S. business logistics costs. 2018 was certainly a challenging year for shippers. Capacity tightened and rates rose. Spot market freight rates increased approximately 25% from the post-holiday seasonal trough in February to the summer peak, then fell up approximately 20% through the end of the year. When we mentioned that 2018 was the worst year in the careers of many logistics leaders, Motor Carrier was the main cul culprit, with shippers noting in SEC filings and analyst calls that market conditions had blown out their logistics budgets. Carriers found that the challenge of attracting drivers is a structural problem, a generational change in the labor pool combined with competition from well-paying jobs such as working at e-commerce fulfillment centers. So spiking demand, tight capacity, and high rates <laughs> replenish carrier coffers for investment, we hope. So the load to truck ratio was elevated in 2018, peaking in June 2018, dropping down to 62% of its June peak by March of 2019. Oil was expensive, peaking at $81 a barrel, uh, before dropping to 57, and as I mentioned, it's, it's forecasted to drop further. Um, after reaching a high in the third quarter of 2018, Class 8 truck orders, those are the power units uh, in, front of the, uh, in front of the trailers on the roads, um, dropped precipitously uh, in the last two months of 2018, and, and net orders have been down since. Uh, in this context, carriers saw 2018 driving improvements in profitability, better operating ratios, and productivity, better revenue per truck, that replenished their coffers. Carriers are investing in new technology, such as in-cab telematics, predictive analytics technology, and near real-time optimization of tractor planning and operations. With this story of asymmetrical pain and gain in motor carriers and the memory of past cycles for company leaders, the temptation to see the other, excuse me, to see the shoe as being on the other foot, and we're talking about the shippers here, and claw back the 2018 rate increases is powerful, and in some cases baked into 2019 budgets. Cautious carriers have been making concessions and have cut back on capacity plans. At the crest of this hill, we see both hope and evidence of a better road being taken. Leading shippers looking to control logistics costs have leaned more in the direction of constructive engagement and innovation than ever before, and carriers have been pleased with the new collaboration while themselves opening up to startups and new technologies for novel solutions <coughs> to transportation challenges. Cresting the hill here means an opportunity to look at new ways to confront the challenges ahead. On to parcel and last mile. Relentless competition, the question is where will shippers choose to compete? As e-commerce sales hit 513 billion or 10% of total retail, partial ex parcel expenditures rose 8.7% to 105 billion in 2018. With rising volumes and customer expectations for shorter delivery windows, it forced a capital intensive rethink of last mile delivery. Regional and crowdsource based solutions continued to grow FedEx and UPS rethought their ties with Amazon as they continued to raise base rates by about 5% and accessorial surcharges by greater than 10%. Amazon continues to disrupt, um, training customers to expect ever faster deliveries while training competitors to chase those expectations. Entering freight brokerage, prime shipping set to same day, 
expanding assets, acquiring a non-vessel operating common carrier license. The chase sparks a furious last mile innovation pace, partnerships and technology advances. But the bigger question is, where will the shippers choose to compete? Earnings reports were impacted by slowing global trade, increased domestic competition, and thinning margins, partially due to an increase in business-to-consumer deliveries, which now comprise half of the parcel industry. This year, we investigate whether chasing trained expectations pioneered by Amazon is a road to riches or ruin. We think it is important to understand differing requirements across product segments and industries. For example, grocery and medicine are better suited for shorter delivery windows, and items such as apparel, furniture, mattresses, and personal care could accommodate longer ones. Needs-based segmentation is an essential building block to allocate premium services optimally and prevent a possible Amazon burnout. On the rails, rail and intermodal expenditures rose 12.9% with Intermodal leading the way. 2018 was a profitable one for North American Class I railroads as precision scheduled railroading, PSR programs drove considerable cost reduction and a strong pricing environment. This improved operating ratios further as targets of sub-60 operating ratios were approached. Railroads have significantly outperformed the S&P since, uh, the S&P 500 since 2016 as they implemented their takes on PSR. While PSR is driving profits for the railroads with a disciplined approach to asset and labor productivity, the transition has caused shippers to experience issues with localized service failures, extended transit times, network congestion, and rail car availability issues. Such issues resulted in pressure from regulators. Like other major transportation providers, Railroads continued their investment in technology, specifically technology that enables enhanced shipper connectivity, shipment visibility, and the use of large railroad and customer databases to apply predictive analytics uh, to improve service levels and asset utilization. Going forward, railroads will try to retain profitability while improving service to retain long-term customers. Major shifts in coal volumes are unlikely in the short term unless energy generation policy changes and so carload volumes are unlikely to improve. In the long term, 15 plus years, we expect rail intermodal to be challenged by the over the road innovation, full digitization, autonomy, electrification, making trucking more competitive and potentially pushing the rail conversion threshold from 500 to over 2,000 miles. On water and ports. So after a great year, turmoil is coming from IMO 2020 sulfur regulation, so that's the International Maritime Organization. Water expenditures rose 12.8% in 2018. Trans-Pacific carriers were among the chief beneficiaries of US-China trade tensions. Their expanded 2018 peak season saw some rates double, as Q4 saw an extraordinary 13% spike in imports over the previous year. Rates will likely settle this year, but at levels higher than last year. Carriers were more disciplined in resisting price wars and deploying capacity. While global capacity grew 5.7%, outpacing 4.4% demand growth, rates were at times the highest they have been over the past three years. There were long delays as imports hit US ports um, in, in the rush to avoid tariffs for January 2019. And with demand soft in early 2019, as most of the cargo was front-loaded due to the trade disputes. Carriers must gear up for the implementation on January 1, 2020 of the IMO 2020 uh, sulfur regulations, which will require significant capital expenditures or the purchase of expensive low sulfur fuel. Let's take a closer look at that. So the 1% um, low sulfur fuel impact um, with this 2020 regulation implementation that uh, carriers must uh, dramatically reduce their emissions either via scrubbers or the use of low sulfur fuel has two potential carrier responses uh, involving significant capital expenditures. Installing scrubbers or switching from marine fuel oil to liquefied natural gas. 
The other alternative, burning low sulfur fuel oil, relies on a supply market that hasn't previously existed. Refineries are reluctant to start making low sulfur fuel oil until they know it will be used, while carriers are reluctant to commit until they know its availability and pricing. Alpha Liner analysts estimate that the cost of compliance will be close to $10 billion, with nearly 20% of global capacity being transitioned to scrubber-based systems. They opine that the biggest uncertainty for the industry is in the cost of low sulfur fuel oil. A.T. Kearney's analysis on the cost of compliant fuel indicates that the spread between the current high sulfur fuel and the required low sulfur fuel will be between $50 to $350 per ton, largely absorbed by shippers, of course, when IMO 2020 goes into effect, equalizing only around 2025. So let's get up into the air. It is uh, soaring on e-commerce and making strides in digitization. Air expenditures wrote, rose 9.2% in 2018. Capacity rose by 5.4%, outpacing demand growth, resulting in a fall in load factors. Despite this, carrier rate discipline saw air freight rates increasing in 2018, jumping about 5% year over year as the east-west lanes peaked at $3.18 a kilo in November. Despite near-term weakness, and you can see there was a drop-off there in the beginning of the year, um, e-commerce and consumer demands for quicker delivery continue to fuel a long-term positive look for, out, uh, for air freight. The past year saw strides made in digitization, including Internet of Things tracking and visibility, automation, of back office and freight services, and other specialized applications such as blockchain. For example, carriers of high value cargo requiring special handling are expanding real-time smart sensor technologies to track and monitor shipments. Additionally, online freight exchanges offer shippers unprecedented transparency into rates, while carriers are now starting to price dynamically. Into the pipelines. We call this Catching up, demand fueled record high production in increases, 17% for oil and 11% for natural gas. Sudden increases can squeeze pipeline capacity. But by late 2018, constraints ease as a result of recent investments. Growing pipeline capacity should lead to fewer shortages and lower pipeline transportation prices in 2019 and beyond. The US became a net exporter of natural gas despite strong domestic demand growth powered by natural gas-based electricity production. Oil exports continued dramatic growth since the lifting of the oil export ban. The production growth was largely concentrated in the Permian Basin for oil and Marcellus for natural gas. Dramatic production increases led to pipeline capacity constraints, which drove um, crude price spread, spreads higher, that were partially relieved by significant capacity additions in 2018. Additional projects are expected to be completed in 2019. <laughs> Finally, private equity interest in the pipeline sector continued to remain strong with 2018 investments surpassing the record levels of the prior year. On to freight forwarders. Customer service is crucial. Global trade grew 9% for the second consecutive year. Freight forwarders' focus on customer services and needs will be pivotal to their endurance and continued profitability, even though they are the most profitable industry in the world when looked at through the lens of return on capital employed. The trade war scramble benefited forwarders. Panalpina, DSV, DHL, and Agility all reported high single-digit revenue growth with double-digit jumps in profits. U.S.-based expediters had a strong year with profitable growth in ocean and air volumes. Net revenue grew 13% and operating profit rose 14%. After initially rebuffing DSV and other suitors, Panalpina agreed to a, a $4.6 billion bid from DSV, who has developed a reputation for deals following its $1.35 billion acquisition of UTI Worldwide in 2016. So the question is, will escalating trade tensions um, leave a mark? on their fortunes, or as they did last year, will they be able to use their global reach and relationships 
to help shippers realign their supply chains. Let's get into 3PLs here. We see them as having an increasingly strategic role with shippers. The gaps between external requirements and internal capabilities at shippers are increasingly being fulfilled by third-party logistics providers, 3PLs. Retail shippers want 3PLs to deliver speed and innovation in non-traditional service lines, and industrial shippers want 3PLs to deliver a seamless and cost-effective supply chain. In both flavors, 3PLs are expected to rise above operational support activities to a strategic role that's expected to have a steadily increasing demand. You can see it in the past and forecasted growth of uh, rate of 3PL revenue that surpasses GDP growth. 3PL market is expected to go 5.3 percent annually between 2018 and 2022. Uh, the 3PL warehousing footprint expanded by 14 percent. Management of speed, cost, and transparency involved in value-added warehousing and last mile deliveries is becoming a necessity for 3PLs to survive the competition. Technology enablement is a competitive necessity as well as a key differentiator for market leaders, with some companies doing this organically through in-house pilots, while others are taking the inorganic approach of acquisitions. Three factors continue to weigh down 3PL shipper relationships to tactical levels. Trust in 3PL capabilities to manage core operational activities, temptation to switch partners for short-term monetary benefits, and the concern of being the guinea pig in trials of technologies and capabilities that are unproven. Let's get into warehousing. Go big and go small. The U.S. warehousing market in 2019 will be similar to the past few years, with record low vacancy rates, increasing rents, and steady onboarding of new warehouse and distribution <coughs> space, with demand still always exceeding supply. Choosing the right warehousing distribution locations remains an essential strategy for shippers seeking to manage rising logistics costs amid increasingly increasing demand for speedy deliveries. Warehouse rent growth slowed, but continued to extend the upward trend. Rents increased about 4%, albeit at a slower rate than in the past six years. Industrial vacancy rates continued to be at an all-time low. All eyes are on leasing activity. The development pipeline remained robust. Speculatively built properties continued to dominate as a majority of all deliverables, of all deliveries. Leasing activity trended towards smaller transactions and e-commerce continued to reshape the industrial sector. E-commerce creates unusual spikes in the size and location of warehouse space desired. Due to their greater variety of products and the promise of expedited delivery to customers, e-retailers typically require three times the capacity of the average buyer of warehouse space. So demand is expected to be strong for warehouses larger than 300,000 square feet. Warehouse deliveries covered only 80% of demand in the 300,000 to 500 square foot uh, band. The ever-tightening service level window is also driving demand for smaller urban warehouses in the range of 10,000 to 100,000 square feet, where supply is even tighter as new warehouse builds lag demand. These spikes represent a supply side problem as on-demand warehouse operators must identify non-peak excess capacity strategies. Traditionally, retailers made up, uh, excuse me, traditional retailers made up nearly 13.6% of US total leasing, followed by 3PLs. Warehousing automation is increasingly being driven by the need to overcome labor force scarcity, um, the need for flexibility, and the speed to adapt to new customer requirements, in addition to the traditional drivers such as operational costs and service level improvements. Examples are found in improved storage. Automatic storage and retrieval systems are becoming more sophisticated, increased picking efficiency with vision picking systems, and goods tra uh, transportation optimization. So uh, autonomous mobile robots are, uh, are coming into uh, warehouses in force. Let's take a look at, at blockchain. A lot, of, a lot of excitement in this space, perhaps uh, a need to get beyond the hype. Uh, the promise of blockchain technology is that a fully transparent transaction ledger 
could drastically improve data transparency and data sharing, thus overcoming some of the greatest inefficiencies in logistics today. A blockchain-powered network could seamlessly show where goods came from, addressing provenance and authenticity issues, where they were going, providing real-time, excuse me, uh, improving payments and border crossing, and where they are now, providing real-time tracking. Because it would be instantaneous and immutable, it would be more trustworthy than today's blizzard of processes and paperwork. Because it would be distributed, it would reduce the risk of central point of failure. The value of blockchain can only be realized with a robust network of companies that are willing and able to adopt a joint solution. The big hurdle is not technology, but participation. And clearing that hurdle requires ensuring the confidentiality of member data to minimize risks and incentivize enrollment. A meaningful blockchain ledger needs to be accessible to and used by all players, shippers, carriers, and regulators, and companies large and small. Like other networks, the best example being a social network, it's only valuable at a scale where everyone is participating. Until everyone agrees to participate, no single entity will gain much benefit. So let's look into 5G, and there's an extensive section in the report on the promise of 5G. Um, in the near term, zero to three years, 5G will reduce the cost of operations and increase visibility for all stakeholders across the supply chain. Huge improvements in transfer speeds, latency, and device density can improve execution efficiency. With greater network deployment and technological maturity in the longer term, three years plus, 5G's increased networking capabilities will enable massive IoT, robotics, AI-based tools, and real-time tracking. Seamless execution and unassisted operations will transform the business uh, economics fundamentally in the industry in ways that will generate higher margins and better service. Looking at trends and outlook, sustenance uh, of market positions requires innovation. So we know that trade tensions are having a profound impact on the industry, with the inventory pull forward of last year gaining momentum and redrawing supply chains in the process. Looking forward, and re uh, looking forward the trade tensions are expected to weigh on growth, but as a result, capacity is expected to normalize for some modes. Players in the industry are being forced to digitally transform and innovate to sustain, not least because of the new players from the Valley, but also because of structural issues like labor shortages. A number of technologies have momentum in the logistics industry. Several key technologies are enabling digital transformation in logistics, with blockchain just one of them, last yard being the, the hot new development, while Uberization uh, and autonomous trucking are entering phases of maturity in their development. E-commerce growth continues, and with it, Amazon is making bigger bets in the logistics industry across multiple modes. Trucking technology is rapidly evolving, and Tesla's Semi is showing promise with fleet owners targeted to be early adopters, but they will need a robust network of electric filling stations before they can venture far. Trends and outlook, a little bit more on that. After the capacity crisis of 2018, multiple signals indicate an easing of conditions in 2019. The global economy isn't growing as fast. Shippers are better prepared for tight conditions. Relative capacity supply will increase, especially in sectors such as warehousing, pipelines, and even trucking, despite the plunge in net class eight power unit uh, orders over the last six months. As the pace of innovation and investment quickens and customer needs become more acute, technological tools should start accelerating the payoffs in efficiency gains. As we've discussed, and you will find in the report, technological enablers are found throughout the range of logistics activities in planning, operations, asset management, warehousing, also underpinning new business models. For now, while there is no shortage of funding and hype for these enablers, there are also successful use cases to propel them forward and into mainstream use. In sum, key forces are at play in an ever-changing business environment with geopolitical surprises always seeming imminent. While the logistics industry will always strive to increase efficiency and cut costs 
it is necessary for shippers and carriers to think about how they will work together to adapt to rapidly changing conditions and build innovation, flexibility, productivity, and sustainability into their operations. With that, I'm going to turn the session over to Kevin Smith, our panel chair, for the panel discussion. Thank you.